And welcome to welcome to Liberty Me Live. We're here tonight with Elizabeth Tate. Elizabeth is a campus coordinator at Appalachian State University for Students for Liberty, and she's going to be talking tonight about social justice libertarianism. And that's kind of a, a scary thing for a lot of libertarians. A lot of libertarians think it's a contradiction in terms. I did somebody who commented on one of the social media posts and said, when's the talk on square circles? So, you know, a, a lot of us have this kind of gut reaction against social justice because a lot of times we hear the people who are you know, rooting for social justice, they want to bring the state into everything. But is that an integral part of social justice? I'll let uh, Elizabeth take over and she'll tell us more. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. Like you said, my name is Elizabeth Tate. I'm a campus coordinator for Students for Liberty, and I am so honored to be giving this talk tonight. In addition to being a campus coordinator, I also write for the blog team, and I've written about pretty much everything from drone warfare to science fiction, but social justice is sort of my basis because in addition to being involved with Students for Liberty, Young Americans for Liberty, and Students for a Stateless Society, I've also been involved in women's advocacy groups and queer advocacy groups at App State. So I sort of came into libertarianism from a background of social justice, which is why this discussion and this topic are really important to me. And I think there's a lot that we can do to bring these things together. So if it wasn't for social justice, I would not be a libertarian. And if it wasn't for libertarianism, I would not be a very good social justice advocate. So tonight, I'd like to make the case that the two ideas are not mutually exclusive. Libertarianism stands to improve from an awareness of social justice, and social justice stands to improve by becoming more libertarian. So like Matt sets, social justice is kind of this rallying cry for the left. You know, people who talk about social justice a lot are usually liberal. Um, you probably are thinking of a teenage girl yelling, check your privilege! and you're not really connecting it with liberty in any way. And that's understandable because a lot of the most vocal proponents of social justice are in that camp. But I think it's time we change that, and I think it's time we challenge that perception. Even though it's a term that's been co-opted by the left, there are ways that that can be changed. There are things about social justice that's going to be integral to libertarianism in the future. Thus, I posit that they are the perfect match for two reasons. One, we're going to be able to recruit more people to the pro-liberty camp if we extend an understanding and empathy for these issues. Two, we're going to be better at making people free if we're more in tune with these problems and the different ways the state is oppressing people. So social justice can be defined as the consciousness of justice and injustice in the distribution of opportunities and privileges, depending on group identities. And you'll notice I said the word privilege. I'm not going to get too much into that right now. We'll be getting back into it in a little bit. So when we talk about social justice, we're talking about gender inequality, race inequality, class inequality. We're talking about legal rights of LGBT folks. We're talking about police brutality that mostly affects people of color. We're talking about high rates of sexual assault that mostly affect women. It's things like that. It's an understanding of and sensitivity to the fact that some people, simply based on who they are, have different experiences. Social justice also tells us that some of these experiences are considered more important than others. And this is the first time I'm going to kind of get into that concept of privilege a little bit. There's a sociological theory, I'm a sociology major, called standpoint epistemology. And what that is, is that where you are in your life and in your experiences sort of dictates how you see the world and how you see the same events. Everyone has a different standpoint. Not one standpoint is the official standpoint. Not, no one can be privileged over the other, like in epistemology. So the same concept sort of applies when we're talking about privilege from a social justice stand, um, perspective, we're saying that there is a certain standpoint or a certain similar standpoint that's being privileged over others. And that standpoint is the standpoint of mostly white, mostly rich, mostly men. So even though everyone has different standpoints, similarities in experience and life will sort of 
give you an experience that might be closer to someone else based on these group identities. And let's start the conversation about libertarianism here, because this is where libertarians usually start to disagree. Libertarianism is so entrenched with individualism for good reason. And it's so entrenched that group identity or identity politics seem to be totally incompatible and not at all something that can be considered. Well, I'm certainly an individual. I want to be judged on my merits. I want to be judged as me, not based on whatever group people think I belong to. I'd like to be considered on the basis of myself, not the people I'm kind of similar to. But regardless of how much of an individual I am, I'm put into groups, whether I like it or not. So looking at me, I'm white. Um, I'm read as a woman. You'd probably guess I'm cisgender, meaning that my gender identity, so how I think of myself in gendered terms, matches up with when the doctor said, it's a girl when I'm born. You might have a guess as to my sexual orientation. You'd probably guess that I have some college education and that I'm middle class, judging by what you heard about me earlier. And all of these things put me into groups. All of these things have something to do with how other people perceive me, how other people treat me, and the experiences I'm going to have. And this goes into how the state oppresses me differently compared to someone else. Since I'm most like other white, cisgender, middle-class women, my experience is going to be most similar to other middle-class, white, cisgender women. And there will certainly be outliers. For example, I'm from the South, so that will make a big difference in my experience compared to others. But still, I'm probably going to have similar experiences to other women like me, white and middle-class, than, for example, a trans woman, or a woman of color, or a poor woman or for that matter, a rich woman. So these group politics really do influence the way your life is lived. And inequalities based on these divisions within the state exist. And convincing you of that might take a while. And that's not really what I'm trying to do with this talk, because that research has been done. There's plenty of writing on it already. And even within libertarianism, we've already accepted some of it. For example, the big racial divide within the drug war. So, like I said, there's research on this already. I'm continuing because I believe these inequalities do exist. And as a result, I think libertarianism needs to adapt to account for these differences because as we've seen, the state isn't fixing them. And that is the big criticism of social justice and particularly the social justice left is they're looking at the state to fix these inequalities. And we haven't seen that work at all. And I think that's a flaw in their ideology that they keep doing that. Because that's where I came from. And I kept, you know, wanting the state to change something and it didn't. It usually made things worse. There's a famous letter written by Abigail Adams to her husband, John Adams, the second president of the United States, in which she advises him to remember the ladies because the laws that were being written didn't have anything about women in them. They didn't have anything about people of color, for that matter. They didn't have anything except laws that pertained to the lives of white men, largely. So even today, when we're still using these laws, these marginalized groups are completely left out of the legal system, and we see that in cases where the justice system doesn't work or when their protections aren't offered the same way. Unfortunately, when the government tries to legislate protections, it doesn't work at all. And affirmative action is kind of the poster child of why libertarians hate social justice. And I certainly don't blame you. I mean, nobody wants the government having any say in who they hire or how they live their life. So, but there's some other reasons that we don't really like affirmative action, and a big one is it doesn't work at all. Affirmative action has only quantitatively helped white women. It hasn't helped people of color whatsoever. When the state fixes something, it breaks it even worse. These acts don't address the real problem, like fair pay acts. They say things like, oh, we're trying to make sure women get paid the same amount for the work they do. But that's not really the problem that's happening. 
it's addressing what people think is the problem. The problem is that there's things like different educational gaps, there's socializing into different roles, gender roles, and those things are more likely to affect what kind of job people take and their pay later on. So that's not even something the state can fix, and yet they're trying and they're making things worse along the way. So this is where libertarianism must come in. This criticism that libertarians have of social justice is completely accurate. They are trying to get the state to fix things, and that is causing violations of civil liberties, and it's making it worse. We know that big government is not going to help. We realize it's not going to help individuals or marginalized groups. So this is where we can make social justice better. We're already opposed to the drug war, right? Massive violation of liberties. But our conversation about the drug war would be sorely lacking if we didn't talk about the racial divide within the drug war. Um, people of color face much higher sentences and much higher rates of incarceration for drug offenses, even though drug use doesn't vary that much across racial lines. The research showed that. That's a social justice issue. It's also a libertarian issue. Libertarian scene stands a lot to gain from extending this kind of understanding to other issues. We can actually stand to move, bring a lot of people into the movement by simply showing them that we care about the same things and recognize that they're issues. People aren't going to be chomping at the bit to join your movement if there is no sense that the issues they care about are going to be changed. That's human nature. We want to involve ourselves in things that we think are going to make what we care about happen. Like, I wouldn't have come to the liberty movement if people hadn't had conversations with me about social justice and how libertarianism could advocate for that. It brought me all the way from a liberal background into libertarianism, into anarchism. It's a lot easier to meet people where they are than to bring them to you. For example, there might be a colleague of yours who cares about struggling low-income families. That is their passion. That is their calling. If you start that conversation with them with welfare shouldn't exist, you've ended the conversation. You haven't given them any sense that, they ca that you also care about this issue. You've just told them, that's it. If you start the conversation with tell me about this issue, tell me about what you care about, and actually listen, you can then continue the conversation with, well, yeah, that's a really big problem. I don't see government welfare helping. I think it's making things worse. And then you're actually having a conversation. You're not just arguing. Have you thought about ways this could be done without a state program? Are there businesses that are making some, you know, big humanitarian efforts? Things like that. You can start the conversation to be a more liberty-leaning conversation. Likewise, if you're talking to someone from a marginalized group and you essentially tell them that their struggles aren't important or don't even exist, you lost them. You, they are not going to listen to you at all. If you listen to their stories more respectfully, if you say, tell me about your experience, and then you say, well, I think I have some ideas for what could be done that aren't through the state, they might be more willing to listen to what you have to say because you've already demonstrated that you're taking their experience seriously. And back to this concept that no one likes, this is actually what checking your privilege means, even though it's been used so poorly by social justice advocates. It's simply an exercise in empathy. I've heard it referred to as a knowledge problem. It's accepting that you might come from a place where you don't know someone else's experiences. It is accepting that you come from a standpoint that might be the privileged standpoint. It's accepting that you might have some benefits that you never asked for and don't want, but you have nonetheless. It's about accepting that the person you're talking to might not have those benefits, even though you never wanted to be above them. It's about just listening when people talk about their experiences and doing so in an empathetic manner. It's about believing them when they say there's a problem. For example, again, I work with a lot of women's groups on my campus. And even though I'm a woman and I'm part of that community, 
I'm privileged in a lot of ways because I'm middle class and because I'm white. So even though I do have privilege as a white a middle class woman, I still have some connection with that group. So let's say we're talking about something like high rates of sexual assault on college campuses, which is a problem that my campus, like so many others, faces. A lot of my colleagues advocate for new policies and new laws to protect these victims, things like affirmative consent laws. And a lot of these things have serious repercussions for liberty that really concern me, regardless of how well-intentioned I know my colleagues are. If I start the conversation with these policies are a bad idea because liberty, I'm probably not going to be listened to because I'm not demonstrating that I know anything about the problem. If I go in and I listen to the stories of survivors, if I do this groundwork and I make the connections, if I make sure I'm understanding some, uh, sending some empathy to these people and understanding where they're coming from, and then I say, I don't think these laws are going to help the problem. I think it's going to make a lot of things worse. I might get someone to listen to me, and at the very least I've shown that I do care about this issue itself and that I'm willing to listen to another experience. It's not just about you know, one agenda. I'm showing some empathy. So as I said earlier, the first reason for social justice and libertarianism being a good match is that we can bring a lot of people into the fold of liberty, like me. That's how I got here. And secondly, we can advocate, or as well, we can advocate for non-governmental means of change that aren't invading civil liberties even more. Second reason is that we are simply going to be much better at making sure people are free. Not having an understanding of some of these social justice issues means we're assuming the state treats everyone the same way, which isn't true. Um, for example, just take marriage equality, saying that the state is oppressing folks that identify as straight the same way as folks that identify as queer was simply not true for the majority of states because some people could get married and some couldn't. That was a difference in experience. So if we have this one-size-fits-all idea of state oppression, we have a one-size-fits-all idea of liberation, and that could leave a lot of people in the dust. Of course, the state isn't the only perpetrator of inequality. There's socializing, there's media, there's individual bias. But the state is a big one if you look at some of the wording of laws, obviously. When we talk about structural racism or any kind of bias like that, we're talking about the state. When we talk about mass incarceration of people of color, that's the state. When we're talking about marriage inequality or the FDA blood ban, the blood ban against men who have sex with men donating blood to hospitals, those are state issues. These things are there. These structural inequalities are undeniably there. And as libertarians, we have to recognize that to correct some massive injustices that are taking place perpetrated by the state. If we act like everyone is having that same experiences, we're ignoring things. We're ignoring that other people might be experiencing the state differently because of the groups they're put into. And if we ignore it, we can't actually achieve liberty because we're not addressing the real problems. Like the state, we're just sweeping it under the rug and maybe fixing something on the surface, but a bigger structural issue is still there. Because we don't know what anyone else is living through. That's a big part of libertarianism. Is only one in, I only know what is best for me. No one else knows what's best for me, and I don't know what's best for anyone else. So we owe it to folks to meet it where they meet them where they are, even in terms of group identity. I will never know the experience of a person of color, no matter how many books I read. A straight man will never know my experience as a queer woman. It's just impossible because they haven't lived through my life. We're the only people who know what we need, right? The state certainly doesn't. And that's why libertarianism and social justice are perfectly compatible. The two ideas need to learn from each other and actually inform each other to make a better world. There's parts of social justice that are totally, totally incompatible with libertarianism. But some of the core tenets are, and those are the parts we need to take and integrate into our philosophy 
and make better. Likewise, we can continue to implement some social justice circles by extending this empathy and understanding and advocating for non-governmental solutions, advocating for private, personal ways to make change without passing more laws that will invade more civil liberties. Libertarians know the government is not the way to solve a problem. Social justice folks knows there's some really big structural issues. Together, we can make some real change, and that's what I want to see, and that's what I'm advocating for with this talk. Not for libertarianism to take a totally leftist approach to save the world, to end inequality. Not at all. That won't work. It will make things worse. What I do advocate for is an understanding of these issues and for us to understand what is happening, be empathetic towards the people experiencing it, and if we can, extend a libertarian way of fixing it. Now, there's definitely further reading on this subject. I'm not the first person to make this observation, so if anyone's interested, I can certainly recommend some further work. And with that, I'd like to welcome Matt back so we can take some questions. Thank you. All right, our first question is from Jeffrey Tucker. Uh, Jeffrey says, you know, many of your points deal with rhetorical strategy, and I do indeed agree, but do you not see any point in addressing fundamental theoretical differences between true and false liberalism? Do we not have differences as regards equality as a social ideal? Certainly, I think we do. I think it's about picking when that conversation is appropriate in a large way. Because if you're trying to make some change or work with social justice folks, that might just not be a very effective conversation because everyone's going to be really set in what they believe. So in finding the common ground, I think it's more important to be empathetic and try to understand that issue. And then once you've made a connection, you can start to talk about differing ideas of what equality means. Things like that. I would say that's not the starting point, even though it is important. Uh, how would you respond to the critics who see the entire conversation around, pr around privilege checking as an attempt to blame those who have privilege and make them kind of obligated to do something? I think that is largely a result of poorly educated teenagers who think they know what they're talking about and generally don't and are just not very good at communicating what they're saying. Because when I hear. If someone tells me, hey, check your privilege, what I hear is you're not really understanding that there's different experiences right now, and you're assuming that your experience is the dominant, the real official experience. And I think that's all that means. I think that that's unfortunately a really hard concept, though, because it's been so co-opted by angry left radicals, essentially. You're not blaming Tumblr, are you? Oh no, I had a Tumblr for a really long time because of the dog pictures. I think, and on the Tumblr conversation, I think whenever you get a bunch of people in one space, the negative voices will always be louder than the positive voices. I think that's almost inevitable on the internet even. And by the way, I guess I should explain uh, how people can ask questions. Uh, there's a Q&A box up above the chat window, and if you'd like to ask a question, just type it in there and we'll get to yours. Uh, we've got another question here from, from Jeffrey Tucker. Uh, he asks, sorry to go back to this equality point, but is there not a better word we can use to describe what we favor, like universal freedom and dignity? The word equality alarms me because it's really not reality. I see what you're saying. I'm not really sure what that word would be. I think there would be some um, differences in communication there. People might not know what we're talking about. But when I say equality, what I mean is equality of opportunity, not equality of resource or wealth or anything like that. And I think that's what most social justice advocates, when you get down to it, mean, um, an equality of opportunity. There may well be a very different, better word for what we're talking about, but I don't know what that is. Our next question is from Chance. He asks, how does social justice address the marginalized aboriginal population? 
For instance, does it consist of state compensation for the crimes of past governments against the aboriginal population? That's a really good question. Um, I think that's somewhere social justice is not silent on, but almost lacking. There is definitely some excellent work done um, in anarchist publications that I cannot think of off the top of my head that's been written about um, mistreatment of Aboriginal folks by the governments. And so while social just some social justice advocates are, of course, advocating for a government solution, there's definitely been talk and work about not doing that. And I think we see that with recent protests about police brutality, too. Social justice people are kind of starting to learn the state isn't the way to go. And I think that's a slow process, but I think it's happening. Uh, Marshall asks, as a gender non-binary individual, I frequently get people telling me that I'm more privileged than, for instance, a binary trans individual. Aside from my privilege as a white person and my privilege as someone with a roof over my head, etc., what would my standing be in the eyes of a social justice libertarian? And for that matter, what's the standing of all non-binary folks? Um, so for people who might not know what Marshall's talking about, non-binary means you don't identify as a man or a woman, to my understanding. It means you're outside of that really binary system of gender. Um, I really don't know. I don't think we can say that any one marginalized group is more oppressed than another marginalized group. I think it's different ways. So, you know, you recognize your privilege as a white person and as someone fairly middle class. Um, but I think different people are going to look at that differently. It's sort of like, is a bisexual person more privileged than a gay person? Well, I'm bisexual and in some ways, yes. You know, people don't necessarily read me as queer right off the bat. And at the moment, I have a male partner. So I'm not really facing any backlash against my relationship. But on the other hand, people sort of don't think I really exist or that my identity isn't real. So a lot of it is contextual and a lot of it depends on how you're looking at it. I don't think there's an easy answer to that question. Uh, Justin <laughs> asks, you know? what, is, what is your Tumblr? And you I don't, don't have to answer that. I deleted it. <laughs> I deleted it because it was taking up two of my too much of my time during finals week looking at dog pictures and bad jokes. So sorry. That's very mature of you. Uh, <laughs> I never got into Tumblr, but I have my own uh, time sinks like that that take all of my time. Uh, Whatever all of it my is, you gotta get rid of it. <laughs> At some point, it's just gotta go. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to. Uh, put out a, a call for more questions here and let people know what's going on here this week at Liberty Me Live. Tomorrow night, we've got uh, our monthly Future of Freedom Foundation webinar. Sheldon Richmond is going to be talking about kind of the straw men of libertarianism that we see a lot in the media and hopefully how we can combat those. Uh, Wednesday night, a cool guy named Cal Moliné is going to be doing uh, he's got a monthly show here called Fight the Matrix where he talks about anarchy. So he's going to be talking about some topic within anarchy on Wednesday night. And he is always really entertaining and fun to listen to, so I definitely recommend that. Butler Schaefer is going to be here Thursday night uh, talking on the topic of his book In Restraint of Trade, the Big Business Campaign Against Competition from 1918 to 1938. He's tremendously knowledgeable about that period of history and about kind of the entire uh, big business co-opting of the progressive movement to really eliminate competition and gain push out competitors. Saturday night we've got Zach Goschenauer. He's going to be talking about uh, the legacy of Gordon Tulloch, the public choice economist who died last month, uh, unfortunately. But if you are, are unfamiliar with Tulloch, you need to be familiar with Tulloch. So definitely come Saturday night for that. And uh, we've got quite a few uh, questions here now. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm going to skip Corey's first question just on general principles. Um, Jeffrey asks, <laughs> okay, let me kind of explain this as, as a white male. So 
much of what you're saying is true and I want to embrace it and yet as a white male something inside me gets weirdly upset when I hear talk like this even when I agree and truly this is why people yeah. get so upset about this stuff how do you explain your point of view to white males in a way that doesn't cause anger and self-defensive reactions that is an excellent question because of course it's not really a great feeling when people are telling you these things especially when you're in that privileged position um, in my experience as a white person what it took was education really not listening to people who are just going to yell at me but having conversations with people especially other white people talking to me about these um, issues and these problems in a way I could understand because I was kind of in the same bubble as they were so I think the biggest thing, biggest way to explain it to people is just to be nice about it. You know, don't attack people and say, you're privileged and you're horrible and you should do something. That is not going to work. That is the worst form of activism. What's better is to say, there's some things we need to pay attention to and things we need to know. And listen to your friends and have conversations with your friends about it. That's the best way, not to take a angry stance just be kind and that's what i strive to do what would you uh chance asks what would you consider to be some marginalized groups that social justice act activists often forget about um i think as marshall was saying non-binary people to a certain extent and i think aboriginal people we don't think about nearly as much i think we don't talk about disabled people and differential access really in a very accurate or mature way, things like that. I think those are three of the biggest groups, but I'm sure there's certainly more that I don't know about because even though I study this, I'm still not an expert. There's so much to know. Does, uh, Wesley asks, how does a social justice libertarian address the assertion that racism is power plus prejudice? Is this a, degree, a disagreement over, over the source of power or should it be a rejection of prejudice broadly, or is it something else entirely? Hmm. Think about that for a second, because I sort of agree with that in a sense, because, so take, you know, my uncle is racist. That really doesn't affect a whole lot, because everyone's just like, oh, he's racist, don't listen to him. He doesn't have any power to really influence his view. You know, he's just being racist in the corner and everyone just kind of ignores him. But if he had any power, if he was a legislator, he could write that into the laws. And so I think that's what we see. I think that statement mostly means that prejudice itself isn't enough for racism, that there has to be a certain level of state power as well, because otherwise it just sort of exists in a vacuum. That's why even though people today are certainly less racist than forebearers in a lot of ways we still have institutionalized racism problems because it's woven up in the state if that answers your questions sorry <laughs> i think it does uh corey asks what are some articles essays and books that you would su suggest to those who are interested in social justice from a libertarian perspective there's obviously the excellent, excellent essay, Libertarian Feminism, Can This Marriage Be Saved? by Roderick Long and Charles Johnson. That was a defining moment for me, reading that essay. That was huge. So I highly recommend that one. Um, anarchist writer Voltaire de Clare is excellent. Pretty much anything she's written, I love very much. Um, Emma Goldman as well. It was really, really great. Um, Charles Johnson also wrote an essay called Women in the Invisible Fist. That's excellent. There's lots of articles on social justice issues on the Students for Liberty blog, written by people like myself, Corey, and a couple of other people in the chat. There's been some really great stuff. And there's some really good social justice books and articles that don't necessarily have a libertarian slant, but don't necessarily have a leftist slant either. Um, I recommend the book The Genderbred Man, which is an excellent look at gender identity and sexuality and um, the new Jim Crow about um, mass incarceration, uh, um, specifically pertaining to people of color. Now, uh, Justin asks, what do you think of people like Bill O'Reilly who point to statistics that point at Asians as being 
the most privileged racial group in America? I think statistics are always contextual. First off, a number can only tell you first so much. Um, I think there's definitely some areas in which Asian folks seem to have a lot of privilege, but they're still facing a lot of stereotype and individual prejudice. Um, I would be interested in seeing how those numbers differed for Asian men and Asian women as well. So I just don't think a number tells the whole story. Like, for example, one of those Fox News hosts had some statistic on their show about, well, more white people have been killed by police than people of color, ignoring that there are more white people <laughs> in the United States and that proportionally we're still seeing that people of color are much more likely to be brutalized by police because they just put out a number and ignored any form of context. So I don't trust a single statistic is what I would say. Yeah, I... I generally get really pissed off when I watch the, the mainstream media news uh, anytime they're talking about statistics because most oh, yeah. of the pundits have no idea like what the problems are of the statistical design of their questions and it's really frustrating. Yeah. And it's not a right-wing Fox News problem, it's an MSNBC problem, it's a CNN problem, it is a news media problem. <laughs> it's everywhere. Absolutely. Uh, James asks, to what extent do you think that uh, equality of authority slash freedom in, in this society would serve as a solution to some of these problems of social justice? Um, if I understand your question correctly, to a large extent, I mean, since I don't believe the state will fix any of these problems, I sort of think liberty will, you know, because discrimination and hiring is pretty economically stupid because you might be passing over very qualified people to do the job and so the company that's hiring the most people or the best people rather is the company that's probably going to succeed so yeah i think liberty and freedom are what is going to affect, what are going to fix these issues but i think that since we don't see that necessarily in the immediate future we still need to be cognizant of these issues as they exist within the state and not just say, well, liberty will fix it, because that's not immediate, and there's some people that really need help now. Uh, Frank asks, he's a, a postmodern author, which will give some, some uh, context for this question. Do you think we are all really just one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively? I will think about that question and get back to you. Um, that is not really my specialty. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I agree. I think we're all experiencing it differently, regardless of identity. Uh, I'm not experiencing the world the exact same way every other white middle class cisgender woman is. So everyone's experience is different, but there we'll see similarities, whether or not we're all the same consciousness. I don't really have an opinion on that. Sorry. Um, you are already getting into the number of questions usually reserved for like David Friedem Friedman and Walter Block. So congratulations. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Justin, uh, do privileged groups owe something to underprivileged groups? And if so, what and why? I think we owe them understanding. I think at the very least there's that because none of us asked to be in the situation. I think it's human nature when we see something wrong to want to fix it. I don't think that's necessarily owed. I think it's smart for all of us to fix these problems. I mean, there's common phrase, you know, sexism hurts everyone. It doesn't just hurt women. There's aspects of sexism that are very, very detrimental to men as well. So I don't think it's a matter of owing anything, but I do think we owe some understanding and empathy to, to everyone, just like we owe that to everyone. But I think it just makes sense for us to want to fix these problems. I don't think it's part of us owing anything as being privileged. I think it just makes sense. Uh, Justin has a follow-up to his what he was talking about before about race, racism, racism being prevalent 
privilege plus power, man, or prejudice plus power. I'm really uh, killing the words here right now. Uh, he says, do you think there's a significant difference between individual racism, uh, charismatic transactions between individuals, anecdotal evidence, etc., and institutional racism? Definitely. There's definitely a, there's definitely a difference. Um, for, you can kind of avoid racist people to a certain extent, I think. You know, you're not going to hang out with someone who's horribly racist, probably. Um, you can't escape it from the state. It's so pervasive. It's when it's institutionalized, you don't have a choice whether to interact with it or not. It's just there. So I think there's a big difference. I also think institutionalized racism is harder to get rid of because we see in every generation, you know, each generation is a little more accepting than the one preceding it, especially depending on how your parents are raising you. But institutionalized racism is still there. It just changes forms. We went from segregation to the drug war, essentially. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Tucker is uh, back with another comment question. Arg, okay. I love all the literature you <laughs> mentioned, but in the end, you have to have property and you have to have capital and you have to have a society that tolerates inequality in order to have civilization. Do you not agree? If so, are you suggesting that we hide these truths? I agree. And again, I would say it's about inequality of opportunity. It's not about um, inequality of resources or capital, because yes, those things are fairly necessary. Um, but what we're facing is that some people have differing access to even try. You know, the problem isn't that not everyone is college educated, it's that some people do not have the option to become college educated or aren't really given any choices about education. So it's that inequality of the opportunity to do what you want. Um, I once saw a speaker who talked about the concept that if everyone was equal, everyone would be subpar, everything would be below average because not everyone is as good at the same things. And that's definitely true. I would counter with that's not nearly as important as everyone having the chance to do it. And if they can't do it, they won't get in. But people aren't being given the option to even try. And that's the issue. It's that opportunity. Uh, Marshall asks, how would you go about explaining a disability that's not necessarily visible to another person? For instance, I'm autistic. It's something that I and many others struggle with every day. Many of my friends also have disabilities that are not necessarily apparent by looking at them. And I'm sure we all know the classic, you don't look sick argument. Yeah. How do I explain this to others who are not necessarily educated on the subject? And how do we go about being included in activist spaces? I think you'd probably know how to explain it better than I would because I don't have any experience with that. Um, I think that as far as activist spaces, if the activist space is not willing to listen to you and extend empathy to you, there might be a point where that activist space is just not worth trying to get into. Um, I know we've had that problem on our campus to some extent. We've had problems with people with disabilities not feeling like they're welcome or included at all. And that's because we're not listening. We're honestly just not listening to the people who are actually experiencing these things. So. You know how best to describe your experience. You know what you live through and what you see on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't, and I have to learn from you. And yes, I, it's my responsibility to do the learning if I want to be an activist for people who are marginalized. Uh, W.C. Smith asks, why do you think well, that there's such a backlash in the libertarian movement against this push for social justice libertarianism? It's because everyone considers it a very leftist, almost collectivist concept, and if that's what it was, I wouldn't blame them. Um, that's all they know about the concept, and so they see it immediately as totally incompatible. Like, I'm sure there were people who did not even come to this talk because of the title. So I think it's that. I think it's just that perception that there's absolutely no way it could become libertarian. And I also think people don't like challenging what they take for granted in a lot of ways. I mean, 
there's a saying every comment on an article about feminism justifies the need for feminism and that's very true um justin asks how would you respond to the claim that left libertarians are similar to liberals and that their analysis of social issues only goes deep enough to confirm their own bias? I would say that's not very true. Um, I think it'll differ between left libertarian to left libertarian, but for my part, I am constantly researching inequalities because that's what I'm majoring in. So I actually know quite a lot about this issue. Um, it's libertarianism. You know, it's advocating for personal liberty and freedom. We just might be coming at it from a slightly different angle. But in the end, I think we're all going for the same thing. Right libertarians, left libertarians, what have you libertarians. You know, we might just be focusing on a different part of it. And I, just a comment on that, like, I, I don't identify as a left libertarian, at least 95% of the time. But I think that there's something like when you see people just reacting against this idea of social justice libertarianism and criticizing kind of this, oh, cultural Marxist thought is infiltrating our movement. Uh, and they like kind of deny the subjective uh, experiences of people who are from other backgrounds. Yeah. I mean, there's something about a, a white cis male uh, saying, oh, you're not, uh, you um, as a black woman are not uh, less privileged than I am, that kind of runs up against kind of the Hayekian uh, insights of, of the knowledge problem. How yeah, would you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's something I think is very important to realize, um, I call it, or my partner originally called it an exercise in empathy. I had called it a knowledge problem. Uh, Jay asks, so why did we get off Asian privilege so fast? Seems to be some institutionalized racism going on in here. Uh, well, quite honestly, I don't know a whole lot about that specifically. I focus in on gender and sexuality. Um, my knowledge of racial inequality is, I would not say it's surface, but it is mostly focused on the relations between white folks and black folks. So I really just need to do more reading on that, to be quite honest. Um, Chance asks, at large, what do you consider to be the largest motivator in the last few centuries towards the advancement of equality and human rights, such as like the abolition of slavery, women's suffrage, general de decrease in racial segregation across the globe? In the grand scheme of human history, considering the thousands of years of continued traditional power structures. What's the single biggest event or movement towards equality or motivator? I don't know. Um, there's so many. The ones that you mentioned, I think that we're going to see these protests against police brutality and mass incarceration and murder of people of color is going to be a huge motivator for the future when thinking about liberty and freedom and equality. I think that is going to be huge. Um, really, it depends. It depends on what matters most to you. For me, a really big motivating thing was not women's suffrage, but the turn of the century anarchist writers like Emma Goldman and Volter and Declare. Um, not suffrage, because I don't really care that much about voting. But things like that, um, what you care about will inform the most important, the turning point, if you will. Frank asks, do you think the world just needs more love? Definitely. Of course the world needs more love. It always needs more love. It'll never be enough. <laughs> yeah, I think kindness is sort of undervalued in activism. Sometimes people are going to just be a lot more interested to listen to you if you're nice. And I don't mean, you know, put up with people insulting you or threatening you at all, but you know, extend some love. Do you think it's more important to be nice? Oh. <laughs> Do you think it's uh, more important to be 
be nice to other libertarians or to be nice to non-libertarians? I think it's important to be nice to everyone. You know, I think, yeah, I mean, on the basis of people are people, I don't think one's more important than the other. I think as an activist, you're going to find it's very effective to be nice to people who aren't libertarians, because if they perceive you as this really mean person, they're probably not going to be that interested in learning about libertarianism. Um, E.R. Horick asks, uh, what would you say is the next step to make social justice a bigger part of the liberty movement? I think a lot of things like this, where we have honest conversations about what social justice could potentially mean to the libertarian community, because we're still dealing with a big part of people just not willing to entertain the idea because of how they have perceived social justice in the past as being this totally leftist movement. So I think the next step is talking about it in open spaces like this more and just trying to reach an understanding about what it is and what it can be to libertarians. Justin asks, how can social justice accomplish its goals without violence? How can anything accomplish its goals without violence? I mean, that's a really big question that gets asked a lot. Um, in the liberty movement, we've seen a lot of change happen through nonviolent means, counter-economics, things like that. So I think it's the same things. I think it's just going outside of the state whenever possible. Um, I don't advocate violence whatsoever. So I think it's about going outside the state, utilizing counter-economics, talking to your friends, and living your life according to those principles. Jeffrey asks, what do you think is the biggest hangup that libertarianism has to for the mainstream to embrace it? Is it ideological blindness, or do you think that libertarianism has not presented itself well? I think it could be a little bit of both. I think, well, firstly, we think of politics as just Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative. We, until high school, I had never heard of another party, let alone ideological political movements. So part of it is just a total lack of awareness and then a just misunderstanding of what it is. People just think it's conservative light in a lot of ways, or they just find the left libertarians and think it's just liberal light, you know, all these misconceptions of the ideology. And then, yes, I think libertarianism does have a little bit of a branding problem in some ways. Um, I was a little turned off by libertarianism while I was in high school from some people I knew that were libertarians that were just sort of, well, I think the government is bad and really didn't give anything else to me. And I was like, well, that's not very intelligent. And at 15, 16, you know, I wasn't exactly going to go read Hayek and Mises and all of this other literature because I was a little young for that. So I think, yeah, we do need to be a little bit better about concisely explaining what we're doing. Uh, Jude asks, how is what you're offering not a total leftist movement? Well, it would depend on what you think of as left. If you think that realizing that people have different experiences based on ideology, yes, it's leftist. However, I also advocate for not doing it through the state, for empowering people to make their own economic decisions and using counter economics as a way to not involve the state and achieve equality. I advocate for free speech like giving this. I think that's very libertarian. Uh, I'm going to get into some of the, uh, the questions that are uh, less high quality such as Corey's question. Actually, no, this is an amazing question. What <laughs> Low quality from Corey? Is, no! <laughs> what pizza topping do you think is most representative of social justice? Uh, uh, pineapple. Because people are very loath to try it, but when they do, it's amazing and they never go back. All also, right. I don't eat meat, so <laughs> it was a little limited there. Um, 
G. Mitchell says, why shouldn't we send all the straight white men to the gulags? Because I think that will just make a lot of people angry and achieve absolutely nothing and just throw mass incarceration in the other side. Um, don't think it'll really help. We'll still birth out straight white men. I mean, not going away. <laughs> Doesn't really fix anything. Uh, Julia asks, will you go out with me? Who? Julia, uh, Percivali. Oh, yes, definitely. Of course. <laughs> um, Justin asks, would you be nice to Hitler? It's amazing how many Hitler questions people get when they're an activist. Um, not Probably not after he killed millions of people. Before, he's just a guy. I mean... I really don't think of any situation where I'm going to have to be nice to Hitler. It's like asking vegetarians if you were stranded on a desert island, would you eat meat? When am I going to be stranded on a desert island? Goodness. <laughs> That's really scary. <laughs> uh, Justin asks, why do you love horrible things like pineapples on pizza? <laughs> it's good, man. The tartness with the saltiness of the cheese. It's just good. Put it on with some mushrooms, it's everything. And we've got one last question here, uh, which I think really sums up everything uh, for tonight. Would you be interested in organizing some sort of Alliance of the Libertarian Left, Left Libertarian meetup during ISFLC? I'm not sure what the schedule is like or where we could fit in an event. I'm willing to look into it, though. Thoughts? The and amount of times uh, I've heard this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, it's been in chat at least three times tonight, so... Oh my goodness. Um, organize? No. I do not have time. Participate in? Yes. <laughs> I will uh, at least come say hi if there's another one this year. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for coming out, and thank you so much, Elizabeth, for speaking to us. Uh, it's thank been you for having me, and, and thank you for giving me such interesting questions. Uh, well, I, I can't. Uh, can't take credit for the questions, but thank you to our wonderful audience for the interesting questions. Uh, hope you learned something, or at least, uh, I don't know. It, I, I don't <laughs> think anyone got done, definitely, from listening to this. This was not a waste of anyone's time. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Hope to, worse. <laughs> thank you. hope to see you back here at Liberty Me Live this week and beyond. Take care, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you.